Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today our topic is how to talk to your alternative medical provider. This is a really great topic to talk about and we get asked about this all the time. I love this topic because I love to talk to alternative providers. I get to do it all the time and I am one. I, I really do straddle between really technical modern medicine and alternative medicine and I'm very science based, but I also don't give in to commercial industrial medicine that is corrupt and captured. So I want you to realize that when we talk about alternative providers, I'm going to treat alternative providers as a group like I would any other group. There are good ones and there are bad ones in every profession. And so uh, first let me talk about the types of alternative providers because there's a lot of them and your conversation is not always the same. The most popular alternative provider in the United States is the chiropractor, of which I am one and very proudly one. Doctor of chiropractic goes to school for the same amount of credits and the same amount of time as a medical doctor and they achieve in some cases more training in certain anatomy and radiology and nutrition than the medical doctors although we get somewhat less pharmacology and surgery and and medication training but we do get very much equivalent hours of training in many other areas and so you can you can go online and look up the training of chiropractors compared to medical doctors there are naturopaths doctors of naturopathy which i respect greatly i respect all of these professions greatly Greatly. Naturopaths uh, in the United States usually get a degree from an accredited school, although there is a movement of, of lay naturopaths, which are people that didn't go to school. They just uh, took a course and became a, a layperson naturopath, which I also think is a great idea. They're not the same thing as a, a board certified naturopath, and, and certain states regulate naturopathy differently. Chiropractic, for better or worse, has achieved you know every state license in the United States, whereas naturopathy has a much looser nebulous regulatory uh, regime and um, I'm not a big fan of, of regulation from above down I, I don't like that but that's just my bias nature paths are of as I said two flavors the those that really finish the medical education and they're often schooled in, in surgery and medication and intravenous therapy and many states allow them to do minor surgery and give intravenous therapy which is really interesting and good and uh, and then there's the lay nature path that doesn't have a, an actual formal education they've they've taken classes and, and they're they're very interested in plant medicine and natural medicine and, and metabolism and sunshine and detoxification, I think that's a great group. But you need to ask your, your naturopath which kind they are if, if you have an expectation. If you think they've graduated from a school and they haven't and you want them to, you need to ask that question. On the other hand, if they're a lay person and that doesn't bother you, go ahead. I have many lay person naturopaths who are, are, are colleagues of mine and I respect them deeply. MDs and doctors of osteopathy. Those are some alternative practitioners have medical degrees. I've got a lot of, of great friends who are medical doctors or osteopaths and they are alternative. They, they have a license and they're regulated by their state boards, but they also practice alternative medicine. And I think that's very cool. There are alternative eye doctors called behavioral optometrists, and they get a degree called an OD, not a DO, but an OD. These optometrists study neurology and they study how to re rehabilitate eye movements and, and what's called oculomotor exercises or eye exercises designed to help them uh, correct their eye teaming, their ability to use their eyes together, their ability to heal problems, uh, whether that be um, an adult with a stroke or a child with a, a developmental delay or some kind of a problem, learning disability that's related to vision. And these vision therapists or, or, or behavioral optometrists are great practitioners. Um, I worked in one of the largest behavioral optometry clinics in the United States in Minnesota in the past. There are also licensed acupuncturists. They often have a PhD or an LAC, which means licensed acupuncturist, and they have a training equivalent to a doctor's. They're often called a doctor, not in every state, but they're, they're acupuncturists who have been trained in traditional Chinese medicine. They understand traditional Chinese diagnosis, which involves tongue diagnosis, uh, abdomen palpation diagnosis, and pulse diagnosis, where they take three fingers and they measure the pulse and they measure superficial and deep pulses and they, and they make diagnoses of the meridians. They diagnose the, the 12 meridians and try to figure out what's wrong with a person in a very ancient Chinese uh, method. You might also meet an Ayurvedic physician, a physician who has, has studied Ayurveda from India, which is even older than, than Chinese traditional Chinese medicine. You may find curanderas, which are usually female, but not always, female healers that are from the Latin American tradition and the, 
Olmec, Aztec, Mayan, different types of, of South American traditions. And these are really very interesting people. There, there's Amazon Basin types of healers and those medicine men and women are, are extremely skilled. You may, you may have one of them. You may have a licensed massage therapist who's not a doctor, but they went to massage school. In Canada, massage school is over 2,000 hours of training. It's a lot of training. Don't underestimate your licensed massage therapist from Canada or from the United States. You may run into a colon hygienist who's gotten a certificate in colon hygiene, or you may run into an athletic trainer who's done a couple of weeks of training and a certificate and, and lots of practice in, in gym work and weight training and working in the gym to do uh, exercise. You may meet a, a master's degree or PhD psychologist or counselor or therapist, like a licensed marriage and family therapist, a LMFT, or you might meet a, a social worker of, of some kind, and there's many different degrees and designations, I won't name them all, but those are largely therapists that do talk therapy, group therapy, family therapy, couples therapy, trauma therapy, infant therapy, you know, they, they do talking therapy with you. They also often do neurofeedback, and sometimes they do QEEG brain mapping. So that's a really neat method of neurofeedback or biofeedback. So there's lots of different types of people in this, this alternative provider network that you might get cued into, and, and I hope you talk to more than one. But generally you want to have a short and fast interaction because they don't have a lot of time, and you want it to not be awkward where you're asking them or accusing them of something, because nobody likes that. I mean, you may, you may suspect that they have an agenda that you don't like, but how are you gonna get anywhere just pinning that on them. I, I don't think that making an awkward conversation makes a lot of sense. But what you want to do is get to the heart of the issue, which is, you know, these are the kinds of questions that I would like to ask a doctor when I meet them. And I want to know, you know, are you going to be an alternative dentist for me? That's another tactic is, is alternative dentistry. Are you going to be a holistic dentist for me? Because I'm always looking for holistic dentists. I'm always looking for, you know, acupuncture and cupping and all the different things out there. So I'm going to ask the person, what is your philosophy of healing? What do you believe in? What is your bias? What do you like and dislike? I might also ask them, what do you avoid? Do you tend not to use certain things? Most of them will say, I tend to avoid modern drugs. I tend to avoid modern surgery if I can. Not to say that they're not necessary or useful at times, but I, I may try to avoid them at, at, as much as I can or reduce them as much as I can. Both the number of drugs and the dosage of drugs if possible. I like to ask every doctor, including myself, what is your weaknesses? What are your weaknesses in practice? Are, are, do you have weak areas. And I'd like to tell people that I'm a doctor of chronic. I'm very good at chronic conditions. I don't live in the world of acute conditions. If you've got acute toxicity of some kind or acute poisoning or acute bleeding or acute emergency problems, go to the urgent care, go to the emergency room, don't come to my office. I am very good with old cold cases and I prefer those kinds of things. I don't really deal with like the acute onset low back pain, even though I'm a chiropractor. I don't tend to deal with the acute onset. I tend to deal with old cold cases, things that have been around forever, people that have been to a bunch of doctors and have lots and lots of, of complexity. That's just my thing. I'm good with complexity. I'm not good with urgency. That's not my that's not my shtick. Do you have a healthy referral network? If your alternative provider doesn't have a healthy referral network, they might have a hero syndrome in which they think they have to fix everybody by themselves. And a mature provider will have a network of people that they refer to because they realize that they can't do anything, everything, and that they need to refer out for different things. And they should realize that they'll have people come to them for different problems and they can be a very valuable source of referrals and concurrent care for you. You may see somebody else and see them. For example, I might go to my chiropractor and I'll go to my holistic dentist. I don't stop going to the chiropractor because I also go to the dentist. So it's important to realize that you may see a number of these people and, and cross over. I have a lot of clinicians that I work with where we share a, a high percentage of patients. Patients see them and I. It's, it's very, very cool. You might want to ask them, what's your origin story? Like a comic book character. How did you become interested in holistic healing? How did you get into this world? How did you become a healer? Why did you do this? Why didn't you choose an easier path in life? There's a lot of easier things to do than becoming a holistic healer. On the other hand, I will note that not all holistic healers are ethical and not all of them are skilled. And there's two different problems. You can be skilled and not ethical, or you can be ethical and not very skilled. I've seen people that are neither ethical nor skilled in alternative medicine, but it's kind of caveat emptor, which means let the buyer beware. It's kind of on you to figure that out. And no regulatory agency is ever gonna do that. Regulatory agencies exist to feed themselves. They do not exist to help you. They exist to feed themselves and support the political entity of the governor of the state. They do not exist to help you, and they do not exist to help the provider either. 
They're not for the public and they're not for you. They are for the government. So they're not gonna help you. They may once in a while put away a, a sex offender and they may make headlines, but most of the time they're not really doing much to keep the bad actors out of the mix. So you wanna find out about their ethics. Now, I like to ask, what is your plan for diagnosing or assessing me? And they may not use diagnosis because diagnosis is a medical term. They may not use diagnosis and that's okay. They may use the term assessment or workup. Chiropractors frequently use the term analysis instead of, instead of diagnosis and that's okay. Okay, but how do you figure out what's wrong with me? You wanna ask them how do they do that methodically? And then you wanna ask them about treatment. How do you treat me? And what, what does the treatments look like? How often are they? How much do they cost? And the most important thing I think is do you have a maintenance model or do you have a treatment model? Are you trying to achieve goals and then I'm done? Or do you have a maintenance model where I continue with you forever? There's nothing wrong with a maintenance model if you know that it's a maintenance model and you don't have any particular goals, or if your goals are to stay within a certain measure of parameters. This gets into energy medicine, and there are some people that want energy medicine and some people that provide energy medicine, and that's okay. But just know that if you're doing that, you don't have a verifiable way of checking if the person is a charlatan. If you don't have objective findings, if you don't have some way of measuring what's wrong with you, and if you're getting better Better, or if you're staying better, if you're, you're staying well, you might have to rely on their sense of energy. Like if they see auras or if they sense energy or if they use a pendulum or if they use a divining rod or, or, or some kind of a implement or something that is psychic like, that's fine if you, if, you, if you do that with informed consent. If you know that this person is using some kind of, of energy medicine, that's fine. But you can't reproduce that. And if you can't reproduce that, you don't have a way of verifying it. So buyer beware. It's okay to do that, but walk in, you know, knowing that you're that you're in that realm. I like to ask how they measure objectively and how they measure subjectively. Every doctor, there is an art and a science to doctoring. It's not a complete science, it is an art. And people forget that doctors are, are there to solve problems for the patient in front of them. They are not there to prove causality. They are not there to prove science. They are not researchers. They are not there to prove the truth. They are there to figure out how to get you well the most efficient way possible and the safest way possible. And I believe that we're there to help with root causes. So I like to ask them, how do you address root causes here at this office? How do you help me prioritize what's the most important thing for me to do? Some of them will admit that they don't prioritize. They say, look, I'm just your dentist. I just fix your teeth. I don't prioritize your health for you. And that's okay. They, they may say that. So you want to ask them about that kind of thing. I like to ask about packages and packages are paid packages for care and treatment. There are a lot of debates over this, and I think that everyone that offers a, you know, a fee-for-service model, which is you come in, you get a service, and I, and I um, provide the service, and I ask you to pay me a fee, that's normal, that's cash, that's, that's how things work, and that's even how insurance works, whether it's insurance or Medicare or cash, you have a fee for a service. However, if a person wants to buy a block of, of, of visits, they can do that. Sometimes that is done in a way that isn't so friendly and it's in a way that seems like a timeshare sales pitch and it's a very hard sell and it's very ugly and I don't like it. It doesn't mean it's illegal. It just means that I don't like it. I don't do it. However, there are some people that do it and they provide very good, good care and they value their care highly and, the, and it's expensive. And so they may sell you packages that may be very expensive packages, but they might give you quite a good discount on each service. Ask a lot of questions if you're faced with a package. I think a package can be a great thing to pay for when you're uh, dealing with a health uh, issue and you've got a lot of work to do. If you know you've got a lot of work to do with a chiropractor or a naturopath or a psychologist or a counselor or a therapist, it may be a great idea to buy a block of neurotherapy sessions or neuro neurofeedback sessions or, or talk therapy sessions. It may be great to buy a package of couples sessions or it might be nice to buy 10 colonic sessions if you're doing colon hydrotherapy or a block of 12 or 24 chiropractic adjustments or acupuncture sessions. Those are very useful and I think that they can be helpful. However, they can also be hard sells and they can also be very urgent. They can have a time limit to them where they, they put a lot of pressure on you and those high pressure sales things are not always necessary. So just be aware that, that people may offer you a package and it doesn't make them unethical because they offered a package, but offering a package also doesn't mean that they're necessarily giving you the best deal. You've got to analyze it, you've got to calculate it. And I will say that, that almost all the state attorneys general in the United States have made it such that when doctors offer a package, 
discount, they have to offer a reimbursement if you quit the package before it's done. So if you buy a package at a discount of sessions and then you quit and, and withdraw and you want your money back, a portion of your money back, the state attorneys general have stated that the doctors need to state to you how they will reimburse you. And usually your, your fees revert back to those higher cash fees. So what they'll do is if you've bought a package of 12 or 20 visits and you've used five of them, they're going to look at those five as though you had had to pay the original full cash rate and not the discount rate that you signed up for. And they will reimburse you the money left over based on how much is left and how much you've spent at the full cash rate because you avoided the discount. So be aware that that is um, um, uh, in the favor of the provider, not you in that case. But it's, it's fair and it's reasonable and it's, it's most states law. Now, again, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not offering medical advice either, but um, I think this is important for you to understand how to talk to your alternative provider.